Welcome, Catholicos, Catholics, Orthodox, Christians, Jews, and all who seek the truth. Uh, today I'm going to do a bit of a book review, and a slight commentary, but mainly it's a book review. Uh, a book called Rabbinic Judaism Debunked, written by two, I guess one can say racially, if that's po could be said, uh, Jews. So people who are who would consider themselves Jews, who were born, I believe, in Israel, who speak Hebrew, but and and became to became believers in uh, Jesus Christ, uh, or as they call him Yeshua. And um, the thing is, though, they are as a as a proviso, as a uh, nota bene. It's like you know. Keep in mind, they have converted, well, they didn't say, they don't consider themselves converted, but simply as Jews who recognize Jesus as the Messiah. So they don't consider it a conversion from one religion to another, but simply as a being faithful Jews, which is actually that's... Uh, um, because we Christians, we don't believe that Jesus invented a new religion. Uh, Christianity is new and not a new invention. We did not call ourselves Christians. It was the pagans in Antioch who called the, 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 the believers in Jesus Christ Christians because from the word Christ uh, being the anointed, the followers of the anointed. And the apostles took that title onto themselves proudly. And the successors of the apostles and all Christ, all Christians after that, we simply consider ourselves followers of the one and only true religion, from Adam through Abraham, uh, through Noah. I mean, you know, Noah, Abraham, Moses, uh, the prophets, and uh, you know, uh, King David, Solomon, and the rest of them, up to. Jesus Christ continuing the, the one and only true religion. Now, this book was written by two authors. One is called, uh, they're both, I guess, got their doctoral degrees. Um, um, one called Eitan Barr, and the other one is Dr. Golan Broshi. It's written here, Brosh, but it's actually, there's an I missing in the, uh, in the name of him, because I looked him up. Uh, so they they are though uh, the form of there there's almost no for a Catholic there's almost nothing to argue about in this book or disagree with but you will get a hint of a Protestant feel for certain things they might say like they might say oh something oh uh, the rabbis have a repetition in prayers well that's not in itself a bad thing if you ex unless it is completely excludes spontaneous prayer. Or they might say, there's a couple of things which, as a Catholic, will say, well, yeah, well, what's the problem with that? But overall, it's pretty good. And the reason is, I, I don't know, I've done a bunch of videos on, gonna, on various books on the subject, and I'll, uh, I encourage you to watch them. So one was uh, Christ Before the Manger, which I did that one, um, The Pre-Incarnate Christ, one which I spent over three hours on, The Jewish Gospels, by, by um, an Orthodox rabbi, uh, not a rabbi, a scholar, Talmudic scholar. And then three books by Dr. Peter Schaefer, uh, Jesus and the Talmud, and uh, Two Gods in Heaven, uh, the ideas of God in Jewish antiquity, uh, the, the, the basically God the Father and God the Son, and the Jewish Jesus... Um, how Judaism and and and, uh, and Christianity formed each other. So I have all three reviewed. Uh, already did long videos on them. This is not going to be a long video. The whole book is about a hundred pages. Um, the the words are pretty, um, you know, good size, so they're not very small. Um, the, my only complaints with this book is that in the bibliography they do have some English bibliography, but then they have the Hebrew. But it's all, of course, in Hebrew, and I don't read Hebrew, so <laughs> it doesn't do me any good. But I guess if you're trying to reach those who read Hebrew, Jews who are readers of Hebrew, they can go into these Hebrew uh, sources and actually um, 
you know, do further research. My other complaint, well, it's not a complaint, but it's a, a slight a criticism. They do quote a lot of, they say, well, the Talmud says this, and the Midrash says that, and the rabbis say this, and then they give you the reference. Um, and so the reference, say, for example, say Mishnah, and it gives you um, the location or, or the passage in the Mishnah, the, where to find what they're quoting. But I would have liked instead of me having to go and find the Mishnah and find the, to, 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 to double check, I would have liked to have the full passages and the footnotes written. But then, of course, the book would, instead of 100 pages, might have ended up being 200 pages because they do have a lot of quotes. So, uh, minor, minor, minor criticism. All right, so we'll start with the, with the, with the, with the rabbinic Judaism, debunking a rabbinic Judaism, because when you watch rabbis online, especially ones which will be the orthodox or ultra orthodox or more conservative kind of alarm, they will talk about the Torah. We you should be studying Torah. We need to. They and this man has so much Torah. His Torah is. And what do they mean by Torah? You think as a Christian, you think they're talking about the five books of Moses. That's the Torah, right? The law, the Moses, the books of Moses. But in fact, what they are talking about is the oral Torah, which is far surpasses the books of Moses and actually sub, subjugates anything in the written Torah. For, for these rabbis, they consider the, the, the oral Torah, which is basically the, the tradition of the sages, um, as superior to the word of God. Actually, one rabbi online, I watched him many, maybe a year ago, and he was saying, well, look, if we are given a choice between the written Torah, meaning the Holy Scriptures, and the oral Torah, we pick the oral Torah every single time because they consider it superior to the very word of God. So this book is actually about the oral Torah. This is the religion of the Pharisees, the religion which... The Judaism of today is not the religion, the Judaism, if you want to use that term, Judaism, Judah, because it comes from the tribe of Judah, from the, 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 the Judean province in, in Israel. That's where the word Jews, the Judeans. So when, when Christ was crucified, it says king of the Judeans, but in English we say Jews. Because remember, Christ will say, will go to Galilee and he would be afraid to go because the Jews, he's, they're afraid from the Jews. What do they mean by Jews? Well, aren't the Galileans Jews? No, when they're talking in the New Testament about afraid from the Jews, they're talking about the Judeans, the people in the province of Judea, which had Jerusalem in it, not in Nazareth and, and, and the other areas. Um, all right, so, uh, so this book, it says here, as in, in their introduction, it says this is a book... Uh, it's an intermural discussion between Jews who believe in Yeshua, Jesus, and those who do not. Uh, so it's not an attack upon anybody. It's, it's just, they're both Jews, we're using the term current these days, but a group believes this uh, Jesus to be the Messiah, the anointed, the awaited prophet, and those who don't. And he says, uh, the one distinct sect, it says here, Judaism had been held hostage under the government and philosophy of one distinct sect, namely the Pharisees, and their heirs, the rabbis. Since the destruction of the second temple, again, they say the second temple, I've done a video call it saying Herod's temple was the third temple. Because Herod, King Herod the Great, removed the second temple completely, stone by stone. He even removed the very foundations of the second temple completely. He put brand new foundations and built a brand new temple. It cannot be called the second temple. And it's a mystery of mysteries why they would, anybody would call it the second temple. If you remove your house, remove the very foundations of the house, put brand new foundations, and build a new building, and it's your, and it's your house, that would not be the same old house. It's a brand new construction. Now, that's the Herod's Temple. It's a brand new construction. But anyways, so they call about the second temple. 
So basically, the sect of the Pharisees take over, took over Judaism after the destruction of the Second Temple. And biblical, and biblical Judaism has had ceased to exist, which again shows you that is Jesus himself is the new the, the prophet, the awaited prophet, the awaited Messiah, who ended the old covenant and bred, brought in a new new covenant, which we're going to discuss in the, at the end of the video. After I finish the review, I'm going to do few, say a few words about new covenant, old covenant, old priesthood, new priesthood, uh, old sacrifice, new sacrifice. Because I had somebody comment and say, "Where does it? Where in the where in the scriptures do they talk about the a new covenant?" Well, uh, in Jeremiah. But anyways, um, so here it says. So what the rabbis say is that this oral law, this oral Torah, came at the same time to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai. So Mount, on Mount Sinai, Moses wrote his written Torah, but the oral Torah, which only the rabbis know, which didn't come to completion until the 9th century in the, in the Babylonian Talmud, it came to Moses, but it's passed on to the rabbis. So, so this is the, 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 the myth they create, is that, well, yeah, there's the written Torah, but hey, Moses was given an oral Torah, which you guys are not aware of, but we, the rabbis, are the custodians and interpreters. So in chapter 1, it's, I'll just read you the chapter names, and then we're going to go quickly through each chapter. So chapter 1 is the ancestors of the rabbis. Chapter 2, A Game of Thrones. Chapter 3, The Advent of the Oral Law. Chapter 4, The Rabbi's New Covenant. The Rabbi's New Covenant. Because it's different than the Biblical Judaism. Uh, chapter 5, The Philosophy Behind Studying the Oral Law. Chapter 6, The Pagan Roots of Rabbinic Customs. Um... Chapter 7, the Oral Law and the Old Testament. Chapter 8, the Oral Law and the New Testament. Chapter 9, the Rabbinic Atheistic Revolution. Chapter 10, the Myth of the Oral Law. Chapter 11, the Foothold of the Oral Law today. Uh, in conclusion, the Oral Lie. That is the end, the conclusion. And they're very short chapters, as I said. The whole book is 100 pages, really. 100 pages, you could finish it in a day, two days max. Plus, their words are not very, like the, the, the font is good size, easy to read. So, um, it says at the turn of the, like at the beginning, around the Second Temple period, um, uh, there were three main sects, the Pharisees, and actually Josephus uses that words word as well. So there was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. There probably were others, but maybe not as big as these groupings. Um, so the Pharisees did not become a distinct group earlier than 150 BC. So before 150 BC, they basically didn't exist. Um, so this sect, which was formed during the Hasmonean period, has defined uh, its members with the title of uh, Chachamim. Chachamim. You hear it all the time with the rabbis. Oh, Chachamim. He's a Talmud Chacham, meaning wise men. Uh, and originally, at the time of Herod the Great, there were only 6,000 men who were members of the Phar Pharisaic sect. So that's kind of a, in chapter one. I'm, I'm giving you just little highlights. So I encourage you to purchase it. I'm not going to read you the book because it would, you know, not be nice. Uh, I, I encourage you to purchase it. But as I, as, I, as a Catholic, keep in mind, it's written by those who don't have the fullness of the Christian faith, which meaning the fullness of priest, the new priesthood, the fullness of the new eternal sacrifice as prophesied by Malachi. Uh, and the fullness of the doctrine. So, uh, but at least they're on the right track, at least, and they're recognizing um, Jesus Christ as the anointed of the Lord. Uh, and chapter 2 is called Game of Thrones. How did the Pharisees manage to take a mandate, 
take the mandate which was initially given by the Torah, meaning the books of Moses, to the priests and claim it as their own, which is what happened. Because it, there was no rabbis governing the church, the, 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 the church of the Old Testament, the ecclesial body. It is run by the higher priests and the priests on the religious side and the king on the secular side. And when there was no king, the ultimate authority was the high priest because he is the voice of God appointed by God himself. Um, and I chose actually the Dead Sea Scrolls Again, there was an, there's a modern discussion whether the, 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 the residents of the Dead Sea um, Qumran community were Essenes or were not Essenes. It doesn't really matter to the point. The point is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they attack the Pharisees severely. Um, so the Dead Sea Scrolls, here's what it says about the Pharisees. They call them among a whole list of other things. I'm not going to read them for you. One of them is deceivers of Ephraim which by their lies of teaching, tongue of falsehood, and language of fraud will mislead many. That's what the Qumran community called the Pharisees. So we have, again, I'm making this video because a lot of Christians want to go to the Noahide laws, which were written in the Talmud for, for basically... And the Talmud telling, you know, it's like they, they, they invent things not available in the Old Testament. Show me the Noahide laws in the Old Testament. You'd have to, as if, you know, for the, for the non-Jews to be good Jews and, uh, you know, enjoy the world to come. And, of course, uh, anyways... So, an ancient historian, Josephus, again, he, they quote Josephus, um, he wrote that the Pharisees commanded Israel with traditional, traditional laws which were never part of the Torah. So, even Josephus noted that the Pharisees are telling Jews, Judeans, and those who are following the religion of Moses to do stuff which was never part of the written law, written Torah. Is the, is the ideas of their sages, their sages. And actually, in the books I've re reviewed previously, they basically talk. If you go against the sages, you basically go against God. You can go against God, but not against the sages. <laughs> that's how, that's how they, 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 they elevate their... Um, um, no wonder Christ condemned them for, for inventing new, new doctrines and demoting the laws of God himself. Um, and he says here, the rabbis could not have implemented their traditions except through an uncompromising separation from the physical and earthly state of government ruled by the priests and kings. So they couldn't do anything while there was the temple and while there was a king. But, uh, of course, the, the, the true kings of Israel disappeared. Like Herod was half Arab or Edomite and Jewish. So he wasn't even a full Jew to, to, to rule Israel. And the priesthood started by the time of Christ. They were being bought and sold. There were two high priests at the same time, which is, of course, an impossibility. Only the, the son, the eldest son of the son of Aaron would be the high priest. Anyways, so chapter 3, the advent of the oral law. Uh... It says the first appearance of the term, the first appearance of the term oral law, uh, the oral Torah, takes place in the Babylonian Talmud, which it is explicitly mentioned in three tractates. Uh, as mentioned, the most ancient written rabbinic documents, documents are dated no earlier than the 2nd and 3rd century AD, which would be the Mishnah. So uh, even though so the oral law just and the Babylonian Talmud, its final completion was I believe around the ninth century. I can't tell you for sure. I think the Jerusalem Talmud was around the fourth century, fifth century. The Babylonian took longer for complete as the copy stands today, maybe around the ninth century or so. Um, the value of studying the oral law is so great, according to the Talmud, even God Himself. God himself spends 
the first three hours of each day studying the oral law in heaven. And he gives you the reference in the Talmud, which says that. So God himself has to spend three hours a day in heaven studying the Talmud, studying the oral law. And actually this rabbi um, I listened to previously, and I can't remember if it was the rabbi himself or one of the books, but I, I'm 99% sure it was the rabbi in one of his uh, lectures. Um, uh, he says, he again, he's quoting the Talmud, or he's, yeah, he's quoting one of these sources, and he says, God himself had to consult the Torah, meaning the oral Torah, because the actual written one came with Moses. So God himself had to consult the Torah so he can actually, before creation, so he can create the world. And God himself had to consult the Torah so he will know how to what animals will be unclean and clean. This is the extent. So God is subjugated to the oral Torah. So who's the creator here? For these rabbis and for modern Judaism, which has nothing to do with ancient biblical Judaism, the, the, the so-called oral Torah is superior to God himself. It is a new religion. It is not the religion of the time of Jesus. Um, the rabbi's idea of Judaism was all about education. Thus, studying the oral Torah became both purpose and the purpose for living. That's all you do. You sit there studying what the sages taught. They, I mean, they, he says actually somewhere, he says you can go and ask any yeshiva, uh, uh, go where they study the, to the Torah. Ask them, what do you they study? And virtually all of them, all of them, they will say the Torah. But you ask, what do you mean by Torah? It is all the Talmud and the Mishnah and, and Tosefta and all of these things. The Bible is like, you know, maybe somewhere there, but above all, it's the Talmud itself. That is the Torah, the sages. And as I said, this rabbi was talking, oh, this rabbi has so much Torah. He learned so much Torah and he gives so much Torah, meaning because actually the, the, the decisions of the rabbis become Torah. That is, <laughs> that is the Torah of modern Judaism. As mentioned, there is no rabbinic Judaism without the oral Torah. The rabbis demanded the honor of kings, and he actually gives you the references where these things are stated, whether it be the, the kings, this is, uh, number 79, and the footnotes. Um, they're so small, the footnotes. I need glasses for them. But anyways, he does give you the, the references, whether it be in the Mishnah, whether it be in, in the, the, the Torah, and he actually gives you. And he, the rabbis demanded the honor of kings and of God himself. It's true. I mean, uh, this, this rabbi is all, you, know, you listen to me. If the rabbi says this, you obey it. That's it. You, you don't argue with the rab your rabbi. The, and the rabbi is is better than the prophet. Because as I said, I can't remember which book. I mean, you got to watch my other videos. They basically say, well, if the, you'll see the rabbi is contradicting scripture. And it's like, well, what the rabbi said, that's, that's the truth. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. Um, in contrast, those who, who carried the prestigious title, Talmud Chacham, a wise disciple of the Talmud, were exalted above the rest and were renowned with all sort were rewarded with all sorts of benefits. So above all, you need to know the oral Torah. Chapter four, the rabbis new covenant. So after the destruction of the second temple, the Jewish world had almost no other religious option than to follow the rabbis oral law because the temple is destroyed. The priesthood is uh, disseminate, uh, decimated. So, so they went all... Because what is the function of a priest? The function of a priest for Catholics to listen and hear and understand. The function of the priest is not a pastor. He's not your pastor. He's not your friend, your spiritual counselor. He is all of that. He is all of that. 
He's supposed to teach you the law of God, the laws of the church, um, sacred tradition. He's all of that. But what is a priest? What is his ontological nature? What is the function of a priest? The priest, his function, his, his raison d'etre, his reason for being, is to offer sacrifice. That is the function of a priest. There can be no sacrifice without a priest. That is the function of the priest. And in the Old Testament, you see, usually the fathers of the family were the priests. They would offer the sacrifice to God. So religion, ancient religion, even modern religion, is, bait, God is offering sacrifice. Now, uh, even we can offer spiritual sacrifices, but physical sacrifice. That is the function of the priest. So in the Old Testament, when the temple is destroyed, there is no more temple. There is nowhere for the priest to offer sacrifice. So the very function, so they had the crisis of identity, the priest. Like, what do they do? Nobody can bring them the rams and the goats and the, whatever, the, the, the lambs, the, the pigeons to, to, to offer and sacrifice to God to fulfill the Mosaic law, to fulfill the Mosaic covenant. They can't do that anymore. There is no tabernacle. There is no temple. So the whole, so the priest function, which is ultimately to offer sacrifice, was demolished with the destruction of the temple, which symbolized the destruction of the old covenant because the new has arrived with the eternal high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So, so what did the people who refused to accept the anointed one, or Jesus Christ? Well, they had the, the sect of the Pharisees, the most fanatical, who had the oral law. This is how you, you, you observe Shabbat. You can't even turn on the car because when you turn on an engine, there is a, uh, an ignition and that creates fire. That means you did the work and you created fire. And that, <laughs> that's, I'm telling you what the rabbis say. <laughs> so you can't drive to the synagogue on Shabbat. You'd be breaking Shabbat if you drive to the synagogue. So anyways, um, it has no other option than to go to the, to the rabbis with their oral law. Because the priests, where did they go? I'm pretty sure the priests themselves had an oral tradition, which they wrote down or maybe passed on verbally from father to son, how to offer the sacrifice, certain prayers to offer in the sacrifice. Not everything is written. It's, you know, it's, it might have been written and then passed on. And because not every, and I mean, in the Old Testament, you see, there are cantors in the temple. So, and like this book, it's like, oh, you know, don't, you know, they have, everything is from the spirit. They pray from their hearts. Praying from the heart and praying from written word is not necessarily contradictory. So, uh, so of course, if you can imagine the cantors, each one babbling his own thing, no, they would have had a certain chance, certain prayers to, 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 to sing in the temple. Otherwise, it would have been a cacophony. Um, so, The yeshiva of the midrash would replace the temple, the temple, the priestly rule, and the priestly rule as the focus point of Judaism. So the, the yeshiva took over the temple and the priestly rule. The rabbis taught that anyone who learns the oral law is considered as though he actually sacrificed a guilt offering because there is no more temple. So they recognize you cannot fulfill the law of Moses. You cannot be purified because you cannot do what God himself has commanded. So let's invent something and say, well, you memorize the oral law. You, you study the Talmud as if it's good as, as good as you sacrifice to God. No, it's not, because that's not what God commanded. And it says here, like it says, they teach the oral law is better than the written one. And that is true, 100%. If you listen to enough of the conservative traditional rabbis, that's exactly what they say. And, and it's, as I said in the other books, that is... You hear the, the, the rabbis and their discussions in Talmud, yes, it's their opinion is above what God himself says. The sages, the, the opinion of the sages is more important than what the prophets themselves said. 
Oh, another device or method which was made extremely popular by the sages was the practice of building fences around the Torah. Uh, basically creating a whole bunch of other regulations around one thing in the Torah. So they created a whole bunch of rules and legalities which God himself never never um, mandated. So again, he, they give you the example of the kosher laws. For example, for the eating meat and dairy. You can't eat meat and dairy. You can't eat a cheeseburger because, you know, cheese is dairy and a burger is meat. You can't mix meat and meat and dairy. That's not kosher. According to who? According to the oral, oral law of the sages, of the rabbis, of the Pharisees. Not according to the word of God. It says here, in the entire Bible, and they base it on a, on a, on a, on a, on a verse in scripture where it says, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. But that has nothing to do with anything else. In the entire Bible, there is no commandment which prohibits eating meat and dairy together. And actually, he gives you a bunch of examples. For example, Abraham himself was eating meat and dairy. And he gives you the Bible that presents example of figures who ate meat and dairy with no consciousness of guilt. E.g. Abraham in Genesis 18.8. King David in 2 Samuel 17.29. King David, so he this is after Moses. He would have known the... That Moses forbade you to eat meat and dairy. <laughs> no, he didn't. But the rabbis with their oral law, the sect of the Pharisees' new religion. He actually calls it the Pharisaic religion. Chapter 5, the philosophy behind studying the oral law. Uh, he calls it the rabbinic religion. Uh, and he basically says a lot of the oral law comes basically from the philosophy of the Greeks. And I think, and I think as well, I was kind of looking on online, uh, the author Daniel Boyeran, he, I believe, has a book about how the, 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 the Judaism, the rabbinic Judaism, uh, is connected with, I didn't read the book, I just saw the title, with basically Greek philosophy. So in this section, chapter, chapter 5 basically talks about how the rabbinic Judaism is so intertwined with Greek philosophy, not necessarily biblical, um, the scriptures. For me, I would say you can take what is good from philosophy and understanding, and, but of course without the exclusion of the scriptures. As St. Thomas Aquinas took the ideas of Aristotle and purified them and applied them to the law and the scriptures of God. Uh, according to the written law, the objective of learning the law was in order to act according to it. So according to the Bible, basically, when you read the law, you're supposed to act according to this law. But for the rabbis, rabbinic tradition is turned an act of learning the Talmud into the work itself. So basically, for the rabbis, studying the Talmud is the purpose of life, is to study the Talmud study the oral law. It's not you read, okay, don't, uh, you know, honor your father or mother. Okay, I'll honor my father or mother. Done. Clear cut. No. I got to read that, and that itself is the work. Chapter 6, Pagan Roots of Rabbinic Customs. Repetition of Mantras. Rabbinic Judaism is, spe is filled with special mantras, which are used as good luck charms. For example, saying certain names of certain rabbis. Um, and, and he gives a whole bunch of examples, but I'm not going to. And it, as I said, he criticizes like having a, a certain book, the rabbinic prayer book, uh, the Sidur. So that it's like you, there is no, no spontaneity. But again, as I said, as a Catholic, there is no different. Like even I'm pretty sure the priests in the Old Covenant in the temple, they had certain prayers, which they would say. They would not be improvising every single time. But that does not contradict this. B, belief in astrology and luck. The Talmud gives an, astrologi the Talmud gives an astrological prognosis of a man's future according to the specific date of birth. Then it says the mezuzah as a good luck charm, which is 
happy to let you read that yourself. The Tfilin, which you see the Jews putting this big box on their head, which has the words of the Lord on it from Deuteronomy. So he says, Deuteronomy 6 8 has nothing to do with Tfilin, the phylacteries, and should only be understood symbolically because God says, Keep my words in front of your eyes. Meaning, you know, keep my words in front of the eyes. Don't forget them. Doesn't mean dangle them in front of your face like that. <laughs> you know? But that's the feeling. Um, and um, uh, he says, number E, prostration over tomb of saints. The practice of prostration on tomb of saints was widespread among the so-called Christian sects. See? Because he's a, they're Jews, but they believe in Yeshua. But what do you mean widespread within the Christian sects? Because they are the martyrs, the martyrs for the Lord. They died, and whoever dies in Christ is with Christ. And where Christ is, so are his saints. So, and uh, it says God is, is, is glorified in his saints. So, yes, the Christian sects, the meaning... The true believers in Jesus Christ, meaning Catholics, meaning those who are belong to the one holy Catholic and apostolic and orthodox church, which were the true believers who are the who follow with the, the, the apostles and the teaching of the apostles and their six the, the successors of the apostles, which pass on the teachings of Yeshua Himself. So to honor the saints of God, yes. So he says, well, that because he's a Protestant, he's a he's a Bible believing Christian. Well, now he's a Bible he's a Bible believing. Um, doesn't want to. They don't like calling themselves Christians, believers in Yeshua, but in a Protestant Christianity. So for them, that's a bad thing. But again, uh, it says uh, so. This practice of um, prostrations at the tomb of saints was adopted by the rabbis. And he uses Christians in between quotation marks. Um, and he says there's 200 recorded sites of rabbinic saints in Israel today. Um, and he says other, other pagan beliefs of the rab rabbinic Judaism, like uh, the existence of demons in bathrooms, the breaking of glass in weddings, reincarnation of souls. Believe it or not, actually, a lot of... Uh, and. Uh, and they actually believe in a... I mean, he gives a whole bunch of examples. And one thing he says, well, they believe in a time of purgatory, which is actually, well, that thing, it's like as a Catholic, it's like, well, that is right. There's a purification. Because it, if you're not... There is a... There, nothing unwhole. Impure can enter into heaven. But, uh, but a little impurity is not going to condemn you to hell. So there is a state of purification. Um, as... That's why we pray for the dead. Any church, any apostolic church, whether they declare explicitly the term purgatory or not, pray for the repose of the souls of the dead. Now, if the dead are in heaven, they don't need your prayers. They pray for you. And if the dead are in hell, your prayer for the repose of their souls isn't going to do them any good. So obviously there's this state of purification where our prayers for the dead will help them. And that is in the universal tradition, east and west, north and south. That's why we know it's of apostolic origin. It's not just the Roman West. No. Ethiopia, Egypt, Russia, all of them pray for the repose of the souls of the dead. Why? Because our prayers will do good for, prayer of the just man will do good for the repose of the soul of the dead. Which means they are in a state between heaven and hell. There's a certain state, which we call purgatory. But yeah, a lot of rabbis will teach about reincarnation. I'm going to knock off the, get away from the book just for a second here, because I want to read you part about the reincarnation, uh, which I didn't believe. I was listening to these rabbis online. It's like, what? Reincarnation? What the, what, where is that in the Bible? It doesn't exist. Where do you get that from? But they do believe it. Um, where did I do that? Here we go. Uh, all right, here we go. Uh, 
So this is actually a little article written by Rabbi Lewis Jacobs. What Judaism says about reincarnation, it says there's, there is no reference to the idea uh, in the Bible or the Talmud, and there's no idea, like there is no reference to a reincarnation in the Bible or the Talmud. And it is unknown in Judaism until the 8th century AD. And it began to ado be adopted by the Karaites, a sectarian Jewish sect. And of course, all the, those that believe in the Kabbalah, the Kabbalists, hold wholeheartedly to the belief of a reincarnation. And he calls an early Jew in uh, the 9th, uh, his name is uh, Saida, lived in 889 to 942. He calls about these people, these Jews who believe in reincarnation. He says, many of them even go so far as to assert that the spirit of a human being might enter into the body of a beast or that of a beast into the body of a human being and other such nonsense and stupidities. Uh, and among other medieval thinkers, uh, he says, uh, Judah Halevi, who died in 1141, and nor Maimonides in 1135 to 1204 make any mention of the doctrine. Um, and there are different parts of, and they, so basically this is an innovation, which a lot of Orthodox Jews or ultra-Orthodox Jews believe wholeheartedly. Reincarnation, which is not mentioned once in the Holy Bible, all their New Testaments, it is not mentioned once in the Talmud. Up to it's an invented belief in the eighth century. They came up with it, and now it's part of the oral law. There's Gilgul and other, and and they'll believe sometimes. Oh, the soul of and actually it says that in the same article. It says. It says here the same person who is criticizing them. He says there. Um, um, So they have this theory of the transmigration of souls. What they mean, what they mean thereby is that the spirit of Reuben is transferred to the to Simeon and afterwards to Levi, and after that to Judah. Yeah, just read this article. It's called "What Judaism, Judaism Says About Reincarnation" by Rabbi Lewis Jacobs. So. Um, all right, so back to the book. So in chapter 7, chapter 7, it always takes me so much longer than I want to. Chapter 7, the oral law. Again, purchase the book. I mean, um, it's not expensive, but it's not cheap, but it's it's useful to have. And if you really want to in go into deeper, you have the references to actually, if you find an, a Talmud in English online, you can probably double check a lot of that stuff. So the Oral Law and the Old Testament. And you can find the book on Amazon. So the absolute absence of justification for the Oral Law in the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, has caused the rabbis to, make the, to, to take radical measures in order to justify its authority. So these chapters, um, so these sections of uh, chapter 7, basically, will present a dozen examples examples of how they attempted to find biblical justification for the alleged oral law. And I will not go through all 12, but uh, uh, so gives you an incentive to go and spend some money, buy the book and go over them. But they give you 12 examples and there are quite a few, quite a few um, uh, it's a good section. It's a long section. And then it continues in the same chapter, page 63. The, the, the sages use several proof texts from the Bible in order to prove the validity of the oral law and their alleged authority over Israel. We will now refute their four, four of the most significant claims which they make. So again, he goes through all four. And you'll see like... Uh, actually changing words in the Bible to allow like perversion of the word of God, basically. And he ends that chapter, he says, um, 
Thus, even if, if there were an oral tradition according to which the Torah was being read, it would, not, would have belonged to the priests, as I said, and had nothing to do with the rabbinic oral law. So after he demolishes all their pretensions. So in chapter 8, the oral law and the New Testament. Now this is important for Christians because I had this comment of, a, I don't know, I guess a former Catholic, Talk said, "Where is the where is in the old te- where is uh, this new new test new covenant mentioned?" I haven't responded to him, but it'll be responded in this video. And then he says, "Look, Jesus himself, you know, he says, listen to those who sit on the seats of Moses." They actually address that point in this chapter eight, the oral law and the New Testament. He says, "Some rabbis and even a few well-known messianic scholars argue that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, was a devout Pharisee." who not only recognized rabbinic authority, but also observed the oral law. Therefore, they claim even Messianic Jews today are obliged to keep the oral law. And uh, in this book by um, Daniel Boyeran, he shows that actually how Jesus Christ was faithful, more strict, more faithful than the Pharisees to the written Torah, the actual word of God, against the perversions of the Pharisee sect. So, um, and he will actually basically show kind of the same thing. Here, um, and they will quote the exact same quote which this guy put on my, on I think the, the review of this video, I haven't responded to him yet, but he said, he says, like they will say, look, um, in Matthew 23, 2 to 3, um, Jesus says, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you. Remember, Jesus says, do what they tell you, but don't do what they do. Basically, when they're sitting on Moses' seat, because you will see Jesus demolishing the Pharisees left, right, and center all the time, calling them vipers, Buddha vipers, deceivers, all kinds of things. So again, he goes through, again, I'm not going to go through it for you. That would be not fair for the authors of the book, so purchase the book. But um, in number four, for example, he says, so point four in his response to this. Um, let's see here, one second. Okay, he said, number four, what did Yeshua mean by saying Moses' seat? Does it refer to a rabbinic authority, as some have argued? No. Rather, Moses' seat, in between quotation marks, refers to the physical place in the synagogue where the scriptures were read. And so, and then, and then he has... Um, support for this interpretation can be found in a village north of the Sea of Galilee called Chorazin, in an ancient synagogue dating from the 4th century, so in the 300s. Archaeologists discovered something called Moses' seat, a seat in the synagogue where the Hebrew scriptures were read aloud. So, in the, in, so it's, of course, the temple would be the priests. In the synagogues, the various teachers so those who could read the Hebrew. So they, they, they sat on Moses' seat, that physical seat, to read the word of God. So Jesus says, listen to what they say when they're sitting on Moses' seat, because it is the words of Moses. And Moses talks about the prophet which was to come. And the Jews have to listen to him and follow him, not Moses anymore. So, he's not telling them, listen to, to the traditions of the Pharisees, because remember, Jesus, how much he attacked the Pharisees and their traditions, which Jesus himself says, make the law of God void. So, Jesus wasn't telling them, follow the, 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 the oral law of the sages of the Pharisees, because if you read the scriptures, Jesus demolishes the Pharisees. They were his enemies. 
and their man-made traditions which make void the very words of God, Jesus condemned them. Um, and he gives the quote here, for example, this in Deuteronomy, uh, though, this is the quote, Deuteronomy 18, 15, which I'm going to get to at the end of this video. He says, the Lord, Moses here, Moses himself. That's why they're sitting on Moses' seat talking, reading Moses to the people. He says, the Lord, this is Moses' prophecy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. And actually, this is not Moses' prophecy. God himself tells Moses to say that. So it says God's own prediction. So it says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. So Moses says, God will raise for you a prophet like me. And what did Moses do? He took them out of the wilderness, uh, the slavery. Uh, he gave them the law and made a new co a covenant with them to replace the covenant of Noah. So the new covenant of Moses. And he gave them a priesthood and sacrifice. So the, 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 the prophets which God will raise like Moses will take people out of slavery, of sin to freedom of the children of God. He will give them a new covenant in his blood, the blood of the Lamb. He will offer them a new priesthood, a priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, and a new sacrifice, which is the ultimate sacrifice of his own flesh and blood on the altar. So he says, again, I'm going to quote the prophecy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Anyways, so this was in uh, point uh, four. So in point six, he says, like if, if Jesus was a Pharisee and told you to obey the oral law, actually in the Talmud here, Jesus is burning in, in, in excrement in hell. That's what the Talmud says, because of course, he was the enemies of the sages of the Pharisees. So he says here, uh, the Babylonian Talmud teaches not only that Yeshua is a false prophet, and he's a magician, idolater, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, he is suffering in hell in boiling excrements. Um, so obviously, Jesus was not telling us to follow the Talmud and uh, the Midrash and the Mishnah. In number eight says, Yeshua specifically told his disciples to beware of the teaching, teachings and traditions of the Pharisees. Matthew 16, Mark 7, and Luke 12. He says, uh, so, so in any case, even the sages have argued that once the Messiah comes, we are obliged to to his government, 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 to his interpretation of the law, and he gives a reference to that. Chapter nine: the rabbinic atheistic revolution. Um, so he gives various examples. Number one: revocation of the Holy Spirit. Two: abolition of prophecy. Um, of course, we Christians, Catholics, have prophecy. We have the private revelations of the various prophets of the New Testament from throughout the ages of the Catholic Church. You had prophets, but again, these are private revelations, private prophecies. They do not supersede the very Word of God or the Holy Scriptures. So, um, even up to Fatima, basically the, the three children are prophets of the Most High, because this is God revealed to them, and they declared the truth of God. But again, these prophecies or revelations which have occurred throughout the ages to the saints do not in any way supersede or come close to the very Word of God. So, because public revelation, which is based upon the faith once for all delivered to the saints, ended with the death of the last apostle, St. John. After that, there is no revelation for doctrine, faith, or morals. But there's various saints have seen visions, 
said prophecies, a lot of them have been fulfilled. So, um, and number three, end of obedience to the voice of heaven. That's part of the atheistic revolution. Revocation of the Holy Spirit, abolition of prophecy, end of obedience to the voice of heaven. Rather, it's the majority rule of the sages. So ignore the voice of heaven. Whatever the majority of the sages says, that is the voice of heaven. Exemption from dependency on the supernatural. Reciting the Siddur rather than praying from the heart. He says the, old, the, the scriptures, they talk about uh, the prayers are never repetitive. Well, Jesus himself repeated the same prayer three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. So it's not rep empty repetition, but contemplation. So there's a difference here. Six, elevating the Talmud at the expense of the Bible. That is absolutely true. So, it's not enough that, enough that they argue that their authority is greater than the prophets, but actually they argue that their authority, the authority of the rabbis, is greater than the prophets in the Bible. Number seven, the sages argue that God puts on phylacteries and prays every day for three hours. Of course, he gives the reference in the Talmud. They claim that God is studying the Talmud in heaven. As I said, this rabbi said, God had to, to, to consult the Torah so he will know what animals will be clean and what animals will be unclean before he created them. Uh, Oh, and he says, oh, they give an, an example. And as, it, as if this wasn't enough, God, you know, has to pray in heaven. Who does he pray to? To himself? He has to study the Talmud because the Talmud and the oral law is above God because God has to consult the, the Torah before he creates the world. The everlasting Torah. It is, that's what they think of it. The, the oral Torah, not their Torah. The Torah of the sages. Um, and as if this was not enough, they also quote God as saying, My sons have defeated me. My sons have defeated me. So God is saying that. Uh, he, God, allegedly lost the argument in a groundbreaking dispute over a certain oven. So God lost the argument to the sages. Number eight, crowning the rabbis as kings at the expense of God. And he quotes uh, like an example with Rabbi Akiva in, uh, in Deuteronomy 10.20, which the verse itself says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him alone only. To him thou shalt, um, thou shalt, do it, uh, thou shalt adhere and shalt swear by his name. So what does Rabbi Akiva say? He says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and also the sages. Yes, especially the sages part, you know. Um, the rabbinic revolution was completed during the times of the Tem Temnaim and their successors, the Amoraim, between the 2nd and 5th century AD. So by the 5th century, we have the, the Yerushalayim, the Jerusalem Talmud done, basically. Chapter 10, the myth of the oral law. Number one, the term oral law and rabbis are completely absent from the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament. Two, there are not even a hint of the oral law rulings in the written law. Number three, there is no scriptural record of any biblical figure practicing the rules of the oral law. Uh... The Bible never quotes the Mishnah or any other rabbinic literature. The oral law contradicts many scientific facts. He gives five examples. One was about the number of ribs, where according to the Mishnah, um, there are 11 ribs on each side of the human body. Physiologically, there are actually 12 ribs on each side. Number eight, the Talmud itself. Basically, the Talmud itself is based on contradictions and disputes because it's all these rabbis arguing with each other 
about what does this mean and what does that mean? And you have a multitude of contradictions and disputes. And that is the oral law. What kind of a law is that if you're having constantly disputes in it? So he goes, goes a whole bunch of other things. Um, number 10, he says, There is no mention of the oral law in the Apocrypha, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or in Josephus' writings. Number 11, which is important, the Ethiopian Jews, the Ethiopian Jews, knew nothing of the oral law. Neither the Sadducees nor the Karaites accepted the authoritative divine nature of the oral law. Recent archaeological findings dating back towards the end of the Second Temple period, again, it's a third temple, because Herod removed the Second Temple, uh, of the Jews who are exiled to Babylon reveal that these Jews show no apparent famili familiarity with the oral law traditions. No external features resemble rabbinic practices. So around the Second Temple period, so 70 AD, 80 AD, the Jews living in Babylon didn't seem to be practicing the oral law. If it was this eternal law which was given to Moses on Mount Sinai and the rabbis kept and taught, then obviously the Jews everywhere in the world would know it. But no, it was only the Pharisees, the, the Pharisees and their sages who knew it. Chapter 11, the foothold of the law, oral law, is basically saying this, Israel is governed by the Pharisees right now. This is the Pharisaic religion, is the religion of the state of Israel. Conclusion, the oral lie. The priests were replaced by the rabbis, the temple was replaced by the yeshiva, and the Bible was subordinated to the oral law teachings. And so it ends. So overall, really a very quick read. Um, lots of citations, but as I said, they, they give you the citations. So if you have access to the Talmud or, or the Mishnah, you can actually read them. Um, and, uh, yeah, as I've said before, it's a made-up religion. Like, Judaism of today is not the religion of Moses. It's not. Just read the Holy Bible. Read it. They can't do any of the sacrifices demanded, commanded by God through Moses. They can't observe any... The, 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 the Jew, even before Moses... The religion of the people of God was of sacrifice, of priesthood. Even before the Aaronic priesthood, there was the priesthood of the head of the family. It's impossible to, 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 to uh, have that religion. So, and actually there's, um, and I heard uh, this uh, author, uh, Dr. Golan Broshi, uh, on a podcast online, and he was talking about his book, and he mentioned that uh, in the Talmud, for 40 years before the temple's destruction, again, he uses the second temple, the third temple, the temple of Herod, before the temple of Herod was destroyed for 40 years, meaning from 30 AD to 70 AD. So basically from the day Jesus Christ was crucified and died, and the veil of the temple was torn, the end of the Old Covenant and we have the new covenant and the blood of the Lamb on the cross, for 40 years, there were weird things happening in the temple. So according to both uh, Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud, so you can search it yourself, go say, uh, um, 40 years of uh, temple, um, Jerusalem Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, and you'll find what it says. So it says, according to the Talmud, I'm just reading off a, off a Messianic Jewish website. According to the Talmud, the rabbinical text central to the mainstream of Judaism, 40 years before the temple was raised to the ground by the Romans, some disturbing and disturbing changes occurred. There are two versions of the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Yerushal, uh, known as the Yerushalmi. Yerusha, Yerushalmi, and the longer, more authoritative Bavli, which is the Babylonian Talmud. Forty years before the destruction of the temple, says the Jerusalem Talmud, the western, so now it quotes the Talmud itself, 
the western light went out the crim crimson th thread remained crimson i think it's supposed to change colors and the lot of for for the lord for offering the sacrifice always came up in the left hand and should come out of the light, right hand they would close the gates of the temple by night and get up in the morning and find them open again that's from the jerusalem talmud and from the babylonian talmud it says our rabbis taught during the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple the lot for the lord did not come up in the right hand nor did the crimson colored strap become white nor did the western light westernmost light shine and the doors of the haikal which is the temple the holy of holies would open by themselves the son the son sino talmud tractate yoma 39b so basically after the crucifixion of jesus christ the the, the temple was finished because the, the priesthood was finished the temple was finished um so you can look at uh, 40 years temple sacrifice not accepted after you'll find a whole bunch of stuff so this is, as I said, the end of this book. Now, if you'd like to stay with me for a few more minutes, people will say, well, where's the, where's the, because as I said, Christianity is not a new religion. It's the continuation of that one religion. You'll see throughout the Old Testament, you know, there was Adam and Eve, and then there was Noah, and God made a covenant with Noah, and continued, and he made, and then God, uh, you know, uh, made a covenant basically with Abraham and then God made a covenant with Moses so we can't say well the religion of Abraham is different than the religion of Noah and the religion of Moses is a brand new religion different than the religion of Abraham no it's a continued and the prophets and then the and then as I said Mo, Moses himself God himself says a new prophet is coming like you Moses which means a new covenant a new priesthood a new sacrifice so we are a continuation of the one true religion not a new religion the 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 pharisaic religion the fake judaism of today is fake judaism it's not real judaism it has nothing to do with the old testament they can do nothing of the commandments of moses that covenant has been demolished destroyed by the will of god because a new and a better one was established very quickly if you look at uh, um do a word search new testament or new covenant matthew 26 for this is my blood of the new testament this is the the my blood of the new testament which will be shed for many so jesus christ himself talks about a new testament saint paul says this chalice in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in my blood, do this. And then and that's in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians. He said, uh, who, all, who also hath made us fit ministers of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. So he talks about himself and the apostles as the ministers of the New Testament. Really the high priests of the New Covenant. So if you do a word search, you'll find a lot of it. Um, uh, and he says about Jesus Christ in Hebrews 9 that he is the mediator of the new covenant the new testament so obviously according to the new testament there is a new testament according to the writings of the followers of Yeshua there is a new covenant because the covenant of Moses was replaced by the covenant of Yeshua the covenant of Yahweh the anoint the angel of the Lord the son of man who came down from heaven and who is in heaven so uh in deuteronomy 18 which was quoted here slightly in deuteronomy 18 uh, um, uh, here it's what it says in uh, verse 15 it says the lord thy god will raise so god is talking to moses here oh uh, no it's uh, no it's moses But thou art otherwise instructed by the Lord thy God. Moses is speaking. He says, The Lord thy God will raise up to thee a prophet of thy nation and of thy brethren, like unto me. Thou 
shalt hear. So Moses is telling the, the Jews, the 12 tribes of Israel, God himself will raise up to you a prophet. And that's why when in the New Testament you see, you see all these um, uh, Jews saying to Jesus, Are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? This is the prophet who they're talking about. The prophet predicted by Moses, who will be like Moses and replace Moses. The Lord thy God will raise up to thee. Moses is telling the twelve tribes, a prophet of thy nation. So a Jew, like somebody who's from the from the Israelites, and of thy brethren, like unto me, so like me. Him thou shalt hear. Not me anymore, it's him now. And at verse 17 it says, And the Lord said to me. So God said to Moses. Now, now uh, they have spoken these things well. So God now, the, now Moses is quoting God himself. Quoting Yahweh. Quoting the Tetragrammaton, the Lord. Which is Jesus Christ himself. I will raise them up a prophet out of the midst of their brethren. Like to thee, like to you, like you, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth. Remember, Jesus says, I only speak what he puts in what he says to me. And he shall speak to them all that I shall command him. He says, I do nothing except what is given to me by my father. And he will not, and he that will not hear his words, which he shall speak, in my name, I will be the revenger. So God himself says, anyone who doesn't listen to him, to the words he says, he doesn't listen to the words I put in his mouth, to this prophet like you, Moses, I will be the revenger. And of course, after Christ was crucified, temple was destroyed, priesthood was destroyed. But we see here Moses clearly predicting a prophet. That's why people were asking Jesus, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? Makes no sense. But the timing of Jesus' appearance was prophesied by Daniel, where the anointed one was to be cut off. Remember, that's a different subject for a different video. So yes, a new covenant was prophesied by Moses himself, because that's what Moses did. He gave us a new covenant, a new priesthood, and a sacrifice. Jesus gave us a new covenant, a new priesthood, and a new sacrifice. In Jeremiah 31, God himself says, Behold, the days shall come, says the Lord, says Yahweh, says the Tetragrammaton, and I will make a new covenant, verse 31, a new covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt the covenant which they made void. And I had dominion over them, saith the Lord. So God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the tribe of Judah, with the house of Israel, but not like the one I made with them when I took them out of Egypt, meaning the covenant of Moses. So clearly Jeremiah says, this new covenant is going to replace the covenant of Moses. I mean, how much more clear do you need to be? But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After the, That's verse 33. After those days, saith the Lord, I will give my law in their bowels, and I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And actually somewhere else in the scripture says God will find a new people, which will match the new covenant. Um, so clearly there is a new covenant predicted, a new testament. Clear. So we are a continuation of that one religion. Um, St. Paul in chapter 8 to the Hebrews, he says uh, in verse 8, he actually quotes Jeremiah, which I just quoted. The days will come when, so I'm not, not going to quote it again. And then in verse 13, he says, and saying, and in saying a new covenant, he hath, God hath made the former old. And that which is de that which decayeth and groweth old is near its end. So again, quotes Jeremiah, which I just quoted. He says, "God says it's a new. Obviously, that makes the other one old. 
and when it's old, it's about it's decaying and it's about near its end. So, um, so as I said, so now we have the new covenant. Well, we have a new priesthood as well, because in the book of uh, we have the prophecy of God saying, "You are you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek," which Saint Paul quotes about Christ as he is the our new high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In Malachi again a priesthood goes with as I said the function of a priest is to offer sacrifice. And there can be no sacrifice without a priest. Okay? So, uh, in the prophet so a pastor of your of your Bible believing church cannot actually fulfill the prophecy of Malachi. Chapter 1, it says, verse 11, From the rising of the sun even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles. In every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation. For my name is great among the Gentiles, saith the Lord of hosts. And he, in verse 12, uh, that's the key part. We can see this eternal, this new sacrifice offered throughout the world from the rising of the sun to its setting among the Gentile nations. And a sacrifice cannot be offered without a priest. A clean oblation. And from the ancient fathers, apostolic fathers, we know this is the, 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 the Lamb of God. This is Jesus Christ. St. Paul actually says virtually the same thing. He says, I just want to Go to continue part verse 12. And you have profaned it, meaning the altar. This, the altar. It and that and and you have profaned it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled. So we, he quotes the priest calling the altar the table of the Lord. So when you see in the New Testament when when the apostle says the table of the Lord, for Christians he is talking about the altar of sacrifice. He's not talking about a table, eat dinner on. He's talking about the altar of sacrifice. So in Hebrews thirteen, Saint Paul says. Remember in verse seven. Remember your prelates. We have prelates, our bishops, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the end of your conversion. Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and the same forever. Somebody to be the same forever is it's only God. Nobody else. Be not led away with various and strange doctrines. We can't be listening to the Spirit and following the signs of the times and inventing new doctrines. These would be perverse doctrines. Uh, in verse 10, he says, St. Paul says, We have an altar whereof, whereof, so from which, they have no power to eat who serve the tabernacle. So those who are still serving the tabernacle, meaning the temple in Jerusalem, who have not believed in Jesus Christ, can't approach our altar to eat from it. And what is offered on an altar is sacrifice. That's in verse 10. We have an altar, and those who serve the tabernacle don't have the power to eat from it. And... Uh, he continues uh, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, St. Paul continues, and he says, The chalice of benediction, verse 16, which we bless, is it not the communion in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the partaking in the body of the Lord? Remember, Jesus said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life everlasting. St. Ignatius of Antioch condemns the heretics of his day, so he immediately successor of St. Paul, Peter, says they won't come to the Eucharist because they won't admit that the Eucharist is the self-same body of Jesus Christ himself who was crucified and rose again. So there is no symbolic here. It is the self-same body of Christ who was sacrificed. We have an altar. We have a sacrificial oblation, a clean oblation, which is the body and blood of the Lamb. He says... Uh, Again, uh, the chalice of benediction, which we bless, is it not the communion, the blood of Christ? The, the, the bread and the bread which we break, is it not the parting of the blood body of the Lord? Um, for we are many, are, for we being many are one 
bread, one body, all that partake of the one bread. Behold, Israel according to the flesh. So he tells Israel according to the flesh, hey, because Jesus, St. Paul says, look, I'm a Jew of Jews, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. Behold, Israel according to the flesh, he's, uh, he's talking to them. Because we are Israel according to the Spirit. We're the sons of adoption. So, behold, Israel according to the flesh, are not they that eat the sacrifices partakers of the altar? So, he puts, he clearly make, makes it clear that this bread and wine the, is the body and blood, is a sacrifice. Tells them, those who partake of the altar are the sacrifice, are not they the partakers of the altar? And then he continues in verse 21, it says, You cannot drink the chalice of the Lord and the chalice of devils. Now he talks about pagan worship where they offer uh, wine offerings or blood offerings to their demons. And... Uh, uh, so in sacrifice, so he cannot, and he talks it about as a chalice, because they did not have a communion service for the pagans. Everyone offered sacrifice. You cannot drink of the chalice of the Lord and the chalice of devils. You cannot partake, be partakers of the table of the Lord. Remember Malachi, he, God himself talks about the altar as the table of the Lord and the table of devils. So we can see that the table of the Lord and St. Paul himself says, we have an altar. The table of the Lord is the altar of sacrifice. And of course, you have to have a priest to offer the sacrifice. Sacrifice doesn't happen by itself. There must be a priesthood. Like Moses made the Aaronic priesthood and the Aaronic sacrifice, the sacrifices. Jesus made the priesthood of Melchizedek and his one sacrifice, which is the sacrifice of the cross of his body and blood, which... His, the priests of the, those men whom Jesus allowed to share in his one priesthood, have the power to offer. As an example, as a, you'll say, where is this priesthood? Well, there's actually lots. And you can see it from the day one, the Apostolic Fathers. They talk about the bishops as the high priests, and then there's the priests and the deacons as the Levites. From day one. So obviously it comes directly from the apostles, from Jesus Christ. So there's the incident where, you know, washing of the feet on the Last Supper, and before the Last Supper, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. It was not just a symbol of the humility of Jesus. Look at how humble he is. Yes, he gives them a hum an example of humility, but that's not the purpose. Read what it says in John chapter 13. So when Jesus comes to wash the feet of St. Peter, St. Peter says, Look, Lord, Dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou wilt shall, but thou shalt know hereafter. So what I'm doing now, St. Peter, ye don't understand what I'm doing now, but you're going to understand later on. Peter, so Peter says to him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. So Jesus, Peter says, No, there's no way you're going to wash my feet. So Jesus says to him, If I wash thee not, so if I wash thee not, if I don't wash you, thou shalt have no part with me. So Jesus says to St. Peter, St. Peter says, look, you're not going to wash me. It's me. You can't just wash me. You're superior to me. Don't wash me. So Jesus says, no, look, I'm showing you a gesture of humility here. No. It is a gesture of humility, but that's not the purpose of the washing. Jesus' answer, if I don't wash your feet, you, Peter, won't have a part with me. That is why you will have no part with me. And what part is he talking about? The high priesthood of Jesus Christ. The high priesthood of Jesus Christ. Actually, even St. John the Apostle is talked about in the uh, history of the church by Eusebius, quoting ancient sources that St. John wore the mitre and was a high priest. Of course he was a high priest. All the apostles were high priests. So, so Jesus says, I have to wash you. If I don't wash you, you can't have a part with me. 
This is the ordination ceremony, the consecration of the apostles as priests of Jesus Christ, who became part of that one priesthood of Melchizedek of Jesus Christ, who were given the power to offer the clean oblation prophesied by Malachi from the rising of the sun to its setting throughout the nations of the world. And this, you say, you're reading things into the text. No, I'm not. This is what Jesus says in Leviticus 8, 6. What happens in the consecration and the ordination of Aaron and his sons to the priesthood by Moses? In Leviticus 8, verse 6, Moses washed them. So Moses to before he could ordain them, consecrate them, in Leviticus 8, 6, he washes Aaron. It's the washing ceremony for the consecration. And then they offer the sacrifice. Same thing here. They wash the disciples. So, before the consummation of the sacrifice. So, this is an ordination ceremony of the apostles. And that is... The tradition of the church, universal. We always had priests, high priests, deacons from Ethiopic Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, Coptic Orthodox, Assyrian Orthodox, churches in India, all the churches, east and west, north and south. It's not a Roman Catholic medieval teaching. No, it's an ancient apostolic teaching. And if you don't accept that, you do not accept the true one and only true faith which passed on to us from the apostles. Um, and actually, another point about the priesthood and about the covenant, in Hebrews 7, St. Paul says, in verse 11, it says, If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. That's in Hebrews 7. So yes, there was a new covenant, a new priesthood, and a new sacrifice. And we know as well that it's a, it's a new priesthood because in St. Paul, Hebrews chapter 5, um, he says, I'm talking about the high priest uh, being taken from among men. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in the things that pertain to God, that he may offer up gifts and sacrifices for sins. So, but again, the Old Testament is not just any man. It was only the sons of Aaron who were the priests. And verse 4 says, Neither doth any man take the honor to himself. Well, actually, if it were talking, if St. Paul here is talking about the Aaronic priesthood, it's an automatic priesthood. As soon as you're the, the son of Aaron, the son of the son of Aaron, the son of the son of Aaron, you're the high priest. And of the other sons, you are the priests. And the rest of the tribe of Levi are the, de the Le Levites, the deacons, basically. So it was not, but he says in verse 4, Neither doth any man take the honor to himself, but he that is called by God, as Aaron was. So he is talking about the New Testament high priesthood, where people are called by God, like Aaron was. So obviously he's not talking about the Aaronic priesthood. So this is my, uh, first of all, a brief review of the book and what I had to kind of continue and talk about these objections which Messianic Jews and some Protestant Christians and others have to the Catholic, the Christian, the true apostolic Christian understanding of priesthood, sacrifice, covenant. So um, that's it. That's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, uh, share it, especially with some Messianic Jews who want to follow the, the oral Torah of the Pharisaic religion, 
which is not the biblical religion, um, and for any Christians who are tempted to follow, again, the Talmud as if it is the Word of God when it is the opinions of the sages, of the Pharisees. Again, that's it. That's all. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe, and share, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.